like in the early days of tech CEOs yeah. becoming super wealthy, they would wear pretty disrespectfully informal clothes as a flex because they could. And then I think we saw the like the height of it with Sam Bankman Fried. If you look at the billionaires today, they're pretty buff. They are they are very muscular. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is why are individuals doing this? I think we need to take a little history lesson here. If you want to understand why Andrew Tate, like he talks about low T males, except you can tell by looking at a male's face how much testosterone they were exposed to when they were <laughs> in their developmental stages. When you look at the far left and the far right, they both seem to have body dysmorphia. Would you like to know more? Hello, Malcolm. Hello, Simone. I am excited to talk to you today. So one of the things I've been doing recently, because I was like, okay, well, Andrew Tate's a really big conservative influencer. I wanted to really dive into his longer form content to understand the underpinnings of his philosophy. Hmm. And a big part of it is be muscly. Look Is like, it? like he he like actively advocates for people to lift. Oh, yeah, yeah. And one of the things he points out, and this is absolutely true, is if you look at the billionaires today, the people in our society that are like top of the social hierarchy, presumably, a lot of them, whether it's Bezos or Musk recently, I don't know if I've seen him recently, or Zuckerberg, they're pretty buff. They are they are very muscular. Actually, it's very interesting. So I think many people have this view of Elon Musk from this one shot of him on a yacht. But if you look at like recent pictures of him, he looks bezos -y. That's what I was sort of thinking. Oh no, does he really? Uh, okay. Okay. But the point being is that you see this sort of across the billionaire class right now, right? And so Andrew Tate taking that as evidence that, look, once you don't have any other needs, you realize the importance of muscle. And then oh. he'd be like, and it, well, as, as oh. a man, as a man, maybe not as, oh, but as a man. Of course. And throughout history, here you, you can see this. The problem is that throughout history, you can't see this. <laughs> what you actually see and what is actually going on here, and this is a very interesting phenomenon to dissect. So like, let's talk about the luxury cars, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you are buying a pointless luxury car to signal your status or build a self narrative of I am a person with X type of things, you need to actually think about what you're giving up when you spend three times on a car, what you would otherwise spit. Sure. Uh, it's the same with muscle. There is a level that you need to exercise to be at optimum physical health. And then there's a level way beyond that, where it is about signaling something to your yeah. environment or to yourself or changing aspects of your chemistry, which we can also talk about. Uh, and the question is, is, why are individuals doing this? I think we need to take a little history lesson here to something that my parents pointed out to me when I was growing up and really helped me uh, contextualize physical status symbols. Okay. okay. So when I was growing up, my house, they actually had a tanning bed in my house. My mom had bought a, a tanning bed for tanning. And my dad, he pointed out to me, he goes, when I was growing up a long time ago, you go, you go back a long time ago, having a tan was considered very low class. The reason why having a tan was considered low class back then is because the lower classes did physical manual labor. So Outside, they would get yeah. tans and then the wealthy, and you can see this. This is why historically you look at the old West or something like that. The high class women would have these parasols all the time. These no, better than yet. Yeah. Have you seen like even middle ages, I think like throughout history, riding masks, they're scary. Like women would wear these. Yeah. Yeah, so throughout most of history, tans were considered very, very, very low class. Well, and even currently, keep in mind, have you seen like the sort of bikini burka face mask things? That, like, well, I want to like... talk about how this flipped again, okay? Okay, yeah. So then there was a generation where tans became common because everyone was like, okay, so first let's talk about how tans became high class. Mm -hmm. Well, what you had is a culture where the lower class, instead of working on farms, because all that had been automated, they were working at McDonald's or mm -hmm. whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So the only people who could spend all day in the sun were rich people. Who could go on, especially like it became to be associated with expensive vacations where you sat on a beach. Yes. Like it was a sign of luxury. So tanning yes. was a sign that you, you could afford to literally fly thing. somewhere sunny, especially like even in the winter months. So let's assume that like the entire population all works inside anyway. But, you know, only the wealthy would be able to fly to some exotic beach and, and get baked by the sun. Yeah. And then, and then tanning beds became common. 
Mm -hmm. And on top of tanning beds, fake tans became common, right? Yes. Which were very inexpensive and they got better and better and better. And then you had this era where, and this always happens when you have these class signals, right? Is that often the, the people who grow up in, in very, I guess you could call it lower class environments, end up overcompensating with this class signal, right? Mm -hmm. So today you'll see this in things like jewelry, right? Where like a rapper may just absolutely cover themselves in jewelry the way you would never see anything else doing it because they're like, oh, this is a sign of wealth. So I'm showing how much wealth I have, right? And you had this with tanning as well, where they would get these really deep, almost comical tans to other people. And then where this really began to become broadcast and that this had become a lower class or very nouveau riche. So there's two sort of groups of nouveau riche. One group of nouveau riche is a group that integrates well with older money society and they, they get considered genuinely upper class individuals. The other group is a group that like, I don't know if you call them autistic, but they don't really get it. Like they get off in some way. And this is what like Jersey Shore. So Gen Z have no idea what I'm talking about when I'm talking about like Snooki or Jersey Shore. Actually I discovered recently that Jersey Shore has a comeback season on television right now, so maybe they do. Okay, but anyway, so this then advertised for the general public, oh, now tans are again lower class because they are attainable to everyone, mm -hmm. and they sort of clueless class, which is generally obvious to both the high class and the low class, has gone overboard with them as a means of status signaling. And now we all know now these are low class. And so then, as to Simone is talking about, it has now again become a, a quote unquote upper class thing to hide your face from the sun all the time, right? Well, and this, this varies across culture and also like varies depending on what technology shows. I mean, obviously right now there's a lot of emphasis on either getting a fake tan or not being exposed to the sun at all because another huge class signifier, or at least status signifier is, is youth, especially among women. So of course they're trying to hide from the sun. But I would say that what you're describing here is a an oscillation that has happened basically as long as there has been culture and you see well, evidence of the oscillation being dealt with in really interesting ways. For example, there's a really interesting course on Wondrium slash by the teaching company on food history. And the lecturer talks about how food, food trends have oscillated between like extremely complex, re disgusting, really difficult to eat meals. Imagine the turduncan where you've got like a pigeon inside a turkey inside a whatever, a swan. And it's just like disgusting versus like really simple food. And a lot of it depended on what what people of, of lower means were able to do. And, and they always want to copy, of course, people with higher means. And then the, obviously the people of higher means rebelling and trying to show that they're different from people of lower means to play their status games. Well, like Baroque style, right? You get to this stage where it becomes so, what was the style after Baroque? Like ultra Baroque or something? Rococo. I mean, it, yeah. uh, like post Baroque was just Baroque plus natural features, sort of like, and, you know, and more dating back to like simplism again. Or like well, yeah. And then, and then we got oh. neoclassical where it went all back to sort of Roman columns and clean lines. You went from like really poofy dresses to the empire waist where you basically have a female yeah. column of a dress. But then of course you also have things like sumptuary laws where literally it has been illegal during many like periods of, of history to to have shoes of a certain length or to have the clothes of a certain color or to you just like own certain objects if you weren't in a certain level of society because there's been so much interest and I think so much like frustration on behalf of like wealthy people who really want to show off their status of like god like these people keep copying me how do I show that I'm special like guys just stop this is mine stop copying me well, and this is how like purple became like a wealthy color right mm -hmm. because it was really expensive to get and you had to crush shells that were only mm -hmm. found in like Phoenicia right and so yeah. they, they, it was one of the major Phoenician industries and then people would outlaw people who weren't in the upper classes from wearing purple once it became easier to copy these colors. Yeah. Um, and you'll see this throughout history. Another really interesting example here, if you're talking about people who aren't from like the Western cultural tradition, is you look at like fat activists and they're like, well, within some cultures, being fat was considered high class. And mm -hmm. that's absolutely true. 100%. But we also have longitudinal studies on those cultures after they acquired wealth and modernity. And it turns out that once there is no longer food scarcity within those cultures, being fat immediately becomes low class. Yeah. Um, yeah. As soon as you introduce them to modern food stuff, where if you are eating like the more addictive, cheaper foods, you get better. Those, those cultures 
every single time have actually flipped to fat being low class. And I would, I would say there's a really strong correlatory factor among people we know. And we know, we, we, we know and are friends with people at every level of the income, like uh, spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. I, I would say that a really common factor among those at the highest net worth level, like way, way, like insanely high is like the best diet and the most disciplined too. Like levels oh, no, of discipline that are, are like chefs that make them like fancy, like fish dishes every day. And they're much more likely also to just be on very low calorie diets, vegetables only. There's no snack foods. They're, they're very careful about those things. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely not even necessarily, it, well, almost certainly it's not about comfort, but let's bring it back to muscles. Cause I think that's really interesting. Yeah, and I'm thinking about uh, ancient Greek and Roman statues. They, people would be like, yeah, see muscles have always been a sign of status, but I actually think that muscles were more a sign of beauty than they were really a sign of status. And when you look at these statues of famous leaders, they are not terribly muscular. They are just sort of like, whatever. You they would have muscular stern. servants. Yeah, and this is, this yes. is true in a lot of these periods. Yeah. yeah. Um, so why is muscle big today? Hmm. And the answer is because it is the single one, it, 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 we haven't really found a good way to fake muscle yet. Yeah. Uh, steroids are now getting big, so I expect this trend to reverse. So we'll talk about that in a second. But it is a, a thing that, assuming no steroids, was actually pretty hard for wealthy people to fake, hard for anyone to fake to an extent. And it required an enormous time investment. Mm -hmm. uh, building big muscles as a man shows there are a certain number of hours every day to look like Jeff Bezos, right? That you don't need to work. Yeah. And that is how it became the class status signal of our generation. The reason why it will fall as a class status signal is everyone basically found out, okay, steroid, like exogenous steroids. So men generate more of these than women, like endogenous steroids, right? More than women. And that's why it's easier for them to gain muscle mass in women. That's why like on average men are like 50% stronger than women in most strength tests. But you can take these extra, you, you can in increase your amount of steroids, right? Historically, when we were growing up, there was a lot of these campaigns meant to convince people that like this caused roid rage and all sorts of other negative effects. The truth is, is yes, it does shrink the size of your testicles and some other things, but generally the negative effects really aren't that that big and there isn't any proof that it causes roid rage for the last I, I i looked into the research on this no. so it's just really not that bad to it's take just a small balls it's it's a small fine. loss well if the, if the if the alternative is class status signaling and working out three less hours a day which it really is like it dramatically lowers the amount you need to work out well and my understanding too is i've never really heard about women caring about ball size and it doesn't affect penis size does it uh, no, 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 not as far as I know. Well, then, yeah, I guess no one really cares. I've never been like, oh my God, have you like, seen term, how small? But a lot of yeah. people, yeah, they don't care about their kids, right? <laughs> um, no. No, no, no. So I guess the point I'm making is there was this campaign that was run in our use to convince everyone that steroids were like this really scary thing. And the truth is they're just not that scary. And, and because the ultra wealthy in our society don't trust science, I can tell you this, we know the ultra wealthy in our society, they do not trust science. They, they do their own research on everything. They have their own researchers working on everything. And they'll say, well, that's oh. something that's happening regardless of level of wealth these days, I think. Oh yeah, well, no, everyone. But I'm just saying, I think there's this perception among the general population that like the wealthy still trust science. They do not, No, not at all. So they do their own research on this stuff and they'll be like, okay, it's not that bad. So it's become really common for them to use exogenous steroids, um, uh, sort of, sort of across groups, you know? Liberty, so you right? think that the, the, the problem here is you've basically got like what the actual billionaires are doing is they're putting in the work, they're doing the training, like they're putting in the time because that's like a, a flex, <laughs> literally. In well, case. it was but a then flex, the, but the pro problem is, is we're going to, yeah, we're going to have soon. Everyone. We have a bunch of people who are cheating by getting mm -hmm. steroids. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, like we, we've gotten a lot of flack for implying that people who are into weightlifting are our steroid users, but I've brought it up with a bunch of people and they're like, oh yeah, like at, at, at this gym, yeah, like huge proportion. And I'm just- I, I, have, I honestly am perplexed. When, when weightlifting people come to us and they're like, how dare you? I'm like, are you really not in the weightlifting community? Do you really not know how common it is? And I think that the only people who really do that are the people who aspire to the social status of weightlifters, but aren't actually in those communities. Because everyone we know in those communities is, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone's on exogenous steroids. It's, it's incredibly common. 
Uh, because why? It's very little downside and it literally shaves the, you know, Who has time to work out four or three hours a day? Yeah. Right? Yeah, you, you, some people do. I guess if you're extremely wealthy and you have like this, this actual like personal aesthetics around, I don't use exogenous steroids. But if you can be, then you can be out competed. Suppose I'm a social media influencer, right? And one of them is actually working out to get the muscles and mm -hmm. the other one is cheating to get the muscles and then spending the rest of the time editing their videos working on ads yeah, yeah. spending more time posting yeah who's gonna do better they're always out compete this is why the yeah. liver king was the liver king ten thousand was it ten thousand dollars a day or something yeah, it was, it was, it was over ten thousand yeah that was um, ten thousand on something but he was, was killing yeah yeah and he was killing it he was killing it right because um, he had the time i guess uh, but, but so for a lot of this there's this belief that then they'll say well no 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 being muscly has always been aesthetically manly and it's like you are not a nerd about history of fashion i am I, if you look historically yes a lot of the times in men, some muscles, because muscles have always been gender dimorphic, okay? Yeah, so yeah. men always had more muscles than women in the same way that like women have breasts and like big breasts would show that you're more female, right? Like gender dimorphism there, Yeah, right? more muscles, more male, I get it. But it's not the muscle groups that we care about today. You look at today, it's oh, like muscle, right? Historically, you look at like medieval England, it's ankles. It's all oh about yeah, no, it's the the, the calf, right? That's the, the, the calf leg. muscle. How big is this calf muscle? Well, you yeah, no, um, calf uh, muscle today. In the French court of Louis the Fourteenth, a lot of it also came down to yeah, like how your calf muscle looked with your little tights on, and especially how your essentially what became your ballet turnout, like when you turned out your leg a little bit, like how how basically how flexible it was and how good your muscles looked in your little tights. And, well, I mean, you look at the Because clothing. that's gender dimorphic. So men would have that more than women. So of course they focused on that, but it wasn't the same muscle groups we're focused on today. Yeah. And when you look at the clothing of men who were considered very dominant, very high class and very much alike George Washington, you can go to the Smithsonian Museum of National History. You can go and look at one of his uniforms and you will see that the man was freaking anorexic. I, I could not fit into... His, Your ancestor, by the way, George Washington. My great, great, great something old. uncle. Yes, but I could not fit into his his uniform. He was a thin man and he was considered extremely dominant. I mean, they wanted to make him king. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, even then in the times of ancient Rome, where I think there was all this, definitely people celebrated the male form and the muscular male form, but they were gladiators. They were workers. Like you, you appreciated them, but like the leaders, the dominant in society. No, well, this is actually different. true about the 1950s. So if you go back at the 1950s, you go back at, back to this era that a lot of people. Like the raw egg nationalist, the, have the bronze egg corporate ideal. Trad. Now, what we always say about this 1950s aesthetic is that it was actually created by Hollywood at the time and should not be looked upon as like a standard of what society was actually like at the time and they didn't care about people then any more than you do today. <laughs> but uh, having a lot of muscle was considered low class mm. uh, because it was it was a, the sign of being a manual laborer. Now, we don't really have manual laborers to a, like, it, there's not a lot of them. If you're living in a city, if you're living in any of the centers of quote unquote culture within our society today, you're not going to see manual laborers. So they assume if you have muscle, it must mean you have a lot of free time during the day. But in mm -hmm. the 1950s, that wasn't the case. If you saw oh. somebody who's really muscular, you'd be like, oh, you're a dock worker. Um, oh, you're Popeye, right? <laughs> then this was not like, no, 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 it's, it's true, it's true. Muscles were seen actively as a sign of being uneducated and low class. And that is only just now beginning to trend. In fact, when you, right? when you look at cartoon tropes, which I think are, are, are interesting indicators, that the, the muscular one is the, the big stupid one, the grunt, which is, is sort of interesting. I mean, like there's Superman, I guess, you know, who's like, you know, pretty muscular. Well, but... no, but Superman, when he's in human world, he doesn't look muscular. Not yeah, in the that's true. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just when he throws on the spandex. He signals class with big, thick glasses. <laughs> it's his disguise. I don't know. Superman's probably not the best example. Yeah. Okay, okay. If you want to understand why Andrew Tate feels he needs to have the body he has versus the reason why I don't care about that, I'd say look at our faces. Oh no, what does his face look like? Oh no. Did okay. he get work done? I mean, he could just get jaw implants. I think he has, I don't know, too much pride for that. And yeah, I guess people would notice if he got jaw implants. Yeah. Um, I, I don't mean to like insult somebody else's look, but I, you think it's compensatory he like because he doesn't he have like a mass. He does not have a masculine jaw. A highly masculine, a masculine nice face. It is not a face that was formed in the presence of testosterone. It is a face that was formed 
actually in the absence of testosterone, he, he really looks like if you imagined him with a weaker body, assuming he's taking exogenous steroids or anything, you'd be like, this is uh, the face of somebody who grew up without any testosterone in their bloodstream. That's interesting. I'm looking up. Oh, oh interesting. You see what I mean? Maybe he, he went not... for the beard to emphasize his job. Well, I'm actually surprised he doesn't have a beard. If I had a... He had, no, he had, in many of the photos, I'm, I'm just looking. I just Googled his name and I'm looking at photos. It looks like maybe he did. He has in, in many of these various lengths of beard going to to accentuate his job. Anyway, no, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So also be careful. I guess that's another good lesson in terms of how to successfully signal this kind of thing. If you want, if you want to play the game, and you want to, I don't know, show off because you don't find people as disgusting as we do. <laughs> well, I mean, you'd probably not do anything that comes across as compensatory. Well, you can see from a male, like he talks about low T males, except you can tell by looking at a male's face, how much testosterone they were exposed to when they were <laughs> in their developmental stages. It is, it is very easy. If you have any sort of the biological training, you have either gracile I know, I know, features or you have robust features. Um, and, but you know, I would say that my heart goes out to everyone who has these types of deformities. Yeah, like, it's not there I know, for example, it's like, you know, fault. many people don't choose partners that show any sign of deformity or whatever. And facial symmetry is a big yeah, part yeah. of that. And I have a decidedly asymmetric face where this part of my jaw is way bigger than this part, meaning I was either exposed to stress or I have some kind of deficiency. That's not true. Our kids have the same thing. It's genetic. They, I can't tell. Okay. So some weird genetic thing, but I mean, that still is a sign of deficiency. So I mean, my heart goes out to people who, who are fucked up in the face like me, who are deformed. <laughs> I'm not saying he's deformed, but I'm just saying like, you know, like I'm here for you. <laughs> They can't all have the Southern gentleman face. I'm sorry. Yeah. Anyway. Although, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I still, I still need the internet to explain what, like, <laughs> why they keep saying you're soy. Um, I, know, I think it's, it's, it's because of the way I, I talk and, and, and act. Like you've even said like, you act somewhat effeminately in videos sometimes because you just don't care. Like yeah, I you, have... you literally don't give a shit. No, but I think, yeah. I mean, maybe that's why I find it so confusing that people find it to be soy because like being I'm willing to do it. around it. Well, yeah. because people don't know. They don't know what it looks like to have no anxiety around gender presentation. I think mm. a lot of the right, one of the things we joke about, and we'll probably do a full video on this, is it's funny that when you look at the far left and the far right, they both seem to have body dysmorphia. They they both have unrealistic body expectations for themselves and unrealistic self-images around their yeah. body image as it exists right now. I mean, I think a part of that is, is because we don't have many role models in our society today that genuinely... Do not care if people are like, oh, you're acting kind of femme. You're acting kind of whatever. I don't care. I have a wife and kids. Like, who am I, who am I performing for? Yeah. But oh, here's post hustle world. What is, what is the next call it? I want to see. What I don't know what the next is, but what I really want to emphasize to our viewers, right? is when you think about the cost you spend on the things in your life that signal self-narrative to yourself. I'm a big, strong person. I'm a meaningful person. I'm a cool guy. Or mm. they signal to your community, genuinely weigh that cost. How many hours a day are you spending on this? What are you getting out of it? When you buy a Ferrari versus me, a used Mazda or something like that, or maybe, your 2010 well, model is great. I was yeah, our most recent, recent car is a used Ford. Yeah. Why? Why are you spending all of this extra time or money? Is it really, other than this sort of immediate dopamine hit you get when you spend the money and you show it off to people, which let's be honest, in today's world, how many people do you really have to show it off to? Not that many. Okay. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't matter that much anymore. Are you really gaining something of, of, of commensurate? It I is kind of disagree. So I disagree because I think right now people have a bigger audience than ever before in some ways. And they're signaling their sin. They're signaling, they're signaling how easy it was to corrupt the things that they were trying to achieve with their life with vanity. I don't know. Anyway, what I'm seeing is yeah. like when I look at people younger than us, or I even just look at people like tiny bit younger than us. And I see like, they post something on social media, the number of likes they get. I'm like, oh my God, I don't like, whoa, man, are you famous? No, like they just, their lives are online. I think that the next place and, and way that people are going to signal status 
And I'm using a heuristic here of what is going to be hard to legitimately do unless you're actually wealthy and you actually have time. Like these are the two sort of limiting factors right now. So what I think, and I, I'll hear your guess after this, because I've primed you with my, my perfect formula, is I think that the ultimate way people are going to signal status is by looking in person as good as they do online. Because right now, a lot of people are cheating online with filters. And that's obviously super easy to do. And everyone's getting super normalized to it. And then only those who are able to pay for the plastic surgery that makes them look like their filtered version of themselves, only the people who are able to keep themselves healthy enough to not need all the filters and actually just look like they do both online and off are going to be the ones to be able to maintain that, that divide. And it's going to be a huge sign of like genuine resource or, or class or leisure. What do you think? I think you're right. I think the other thing is, is a lot of people would say followers, but not exactly followers because those will be easy no. fake. Whiz, whiz. Easy fake. It is high status followers. Um, How many high status huh. people follow you mm. and interact with you and talk about you? Oh, so that's interesting because not, not every platform allows you to see who. Yeah. Who well, I think that's the core. So Twitter converts very, very poorly. X, whatever, whatever we want to call it these days. Uh, X converts very poorly. It does not convert to book sales. It does not convert to people coming to our YouTube. It does not convert to stuff. But it's where all. people can show off who follows them. But it's right? very good at showing off who follows you and who respects your opinion. So mm. like, we don't have a lot of followers on Twitter. We've got like 5,000 or something. But we have a lot of really high status followers, which no, signal a little niche in the world. people invite us to parties and stuff, right? Hmm. I think that's a good one. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. But it, again, it has to be a thing that, that yeah, that, that only those with wealth or, or status or leisure will be able to achieve. And I think that those are really the things. It's, it's, it's still yeah. really expensive to get plastic surgery or to genuinely look as good as you can look online. It's only going to get worse. And it's, it's yeah, genuinely hard to get someone who's talking about how important muscle is. is like a woman in the 90s talking about how great a tan is. Yeah, don't, yeah. You know, don't you know that it's sitting in the sun you're capturing the rays of the earth and exposing your true femininity and that's why i do it nude so that i i i capture all of this earth energy and i'm genuinely at one with oh, my hold on. do you but do you know about the whole like men exposing their balls to the sun thing going on right now there's like a current trend of this I, i've I, heard it's dumb as hell it's I know, but I'm just saying there's a lot of other really weird stuff that's going on with like you sun exposure. You can anyone to do dumb stuff. The placebo effect is really strong. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, also like tans help you more easily conceal blemishes and other things like that. I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons why people like tans that don't necessarily have to do with social class, but it is, it is a good example and how it oscillates. And, and it is one of those limiting factor things. But I think that's the formula is, is this something that you can only get because of status or wealth or a lot of leisure time, which, you know, only those with resources. Yep. Can well, and I also think that the people, we know a lot of wealthy people from a lot of, of groups, the ones who have been able to resist this muscle trend are also the ones who don't own things like fancy cars. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's specifically susceptible to the people who need to show off all the hot women there was and all their fancy cars. Well, and, and to a certain extent, it exposes new money, right? Because- Well, like, I say new money, but a level of insecurity, a level of I earned money just so I could signal my status to other people. Yeah, well, I think, oh, here's an interesting example of it that shows that the status cycle is, is informally dressing as a flex, right? Like in the early days of tech CEOs yeah. becoming super wealthy, they would wear- they would wear pretty disrespectfully informal clothes as a flex because they could, because it just had that much money. They were oh, still yeah, out yeah. in the room. And then I think we saw the, like the height of it with Sam Bankman fried, who was not only like wearing very respectfully informal clothes, but like even behaving disrespectfully, like playing games while on key interviews. Oh, I love this. Okay. So people don't know Sam Bankman fried FTX, big EA guy, basically funded 80% of all effective algorithm stuff. Interesting. And yeah. he would always flex about how, oh, like he was living inexpensively, right? Expensively. So that he could give all his money to charity, okay? Right? But then you'd see him on business meetings and he'd be playing League of Legends, right? This was the famous thing that he would do. Why, why was he doing this? This this was not to give money to effective altruism. It was to show class status through insulting 
the other people in the meeting without having them leave. The moment I saw that, I knew all this guy cared about was status. Because you look at us and the ways that we save money. We try to donate around 50% of our yearly income to, to charities or, or, or causes like that. And, and this has been recorded in newspapers. So we're not BSing this. This isn't like <laughs> Telegraph and stuff. And we do that through extreme daily austerity. But I would never disrespect a business partner or waste time that I could be spending being productive, being indolent. Oh, indolent, whether it's video games or the gym, if it is not moving you towards your objective function, the thing that you believe has value in the world, right? And I hope that's not your personal aesthetics. Um, then it is a sin. It's, it's sinful. And we all engage in sin. I engage in sin myself. This doesn't help me. But at least when I am doing it, I acknowledge the cost of that sin to my lifestyle. I do not pretend like my sin is a virtue, whether that... Yeah, I think there's a... In terms of successfully signaling status, like using these in some way, r rarefied commodities, be it a tan or a not tan or muscles or wearing informal clothes, there's a level of moderation that's required. And there's also a level of trailblazing that's required to genuinely show it, right? Because once everyone's doing it, or once a certain critical mass of people is doing it, it starts being seen as a, a demonstration, not of status or of genuine dominance, but of status anxiety. And the, the reason why you're doing it or why you're doing it in excess is because you feel like you need to signal your status. And if you feel like you need to signal your status, it's because you you personally, at least, don't feel like you have it in the first place. I think that's why many, for example, designer brands have come to be seen as actually quite trashy by many groups. Because like- Gucci or something is seen as pretty trashy these days, right? Yes, yeah, because, because the groups of, who, are, who are desperate to signal status are, are getting it in excess. So I think if, if there's also a takeaway on like, how to leverage this dynamic in a way that genuinely impresses people. One, don't do something that's overplayed. And two, just look for something. It, it can even be unique that just demonstrates that you have more time or money or resources than other people. But honestly, like the copycat approach, doing it by currently like getting more muscle or flexing that you can be informal somewhere or even traveling to expensive vacation destinations just isn't really going to impress people anymore because it's being... It's already being signaled by too many people who are extremely status anxious. Yeah. Oh, well, still, I love talking about this. I'm, I'm really excited to see how we're going to tackle this with our kids when they all become very self-conscious around puberty. This, it's, it's one thing for us to feel comfortable with the subjects and to be comfortable with ourselves, but helping a, a teenage young adult make it through this? Is it possible? I don't know. I mean, I, I think it honestly, I don't think in Amish communities you're seeing huge levels of body dysmorphia. I think that no, they are. Yeah. But anyway, I'm looking forward to talking. Well, it's interesting within Amish communities because class uh, is not determined by wealth in any extent. Hmm. Uh, the, the class status signaling is around things like beard links. It's around things like biblical knowledge. There are many different ways you can determine. I like class. that both beard length and biblical knowledge are both. Well, um, there was a, a hate crime case recently. And actually, some Amish cut off other Amish men's beards. Oh, <gasps> shots fired. Well, I know you see that as trivial, but to them. No, I don't know. I learned from Shanghai Noon with Jackie Chan that having hair cut off is like super not cool. All right. But yeah, well, this is true as in some like Asian communities. Yeah, like, like the top knot, to man, no, yeah. like no, the ceremonial hair. You do not, you do not touch in any culture with any gender. You do not, you do not touch weave. You do not touch ceremonial top knots and you do not touch beards. Just draw the line. But anyway, Malcolm, we got to move on with our lives. It is so wonderful to have you back from a business trip. I love you so I much. Love you, Simone. you are amazing. You are so great to be married to. When you were gone, every moment was suffering because you are just such an amazing integral part <laughs> of my daily feeling of of, of completeness. And, and Malcolm, so thank you, you for being here. You are my status signal, my status totem. I, I, yeah, I heard when you left, everyone was like, are you a model? And I was like, that made me feel good. Cause I was like- Oh, yeah. so yeah, I'm your trophy wife and you're my, I, my my status, my trophy husband. My, my favorite moment in the pronatalist saying was there was this person on Twitter being like, oh, these people are disgusting. And someone was like, 
don't you know that they don't actually look like that? That's a pair of models that was hired to promote the pronatalist movement. And, and so, so, yeah, it was like the best like themselves. insult that was really a compliment that was yeah. totally not meant as a compliment. I was incredibly sweet. Whoever you out there, you we out there you. who tried to insult us with that, yeah, it, thank it really you. meant the world to us. So I have been riding on that horse for a long time. Yeah, the best thing we ever heard, man. Yeah. All right, Malcolm. <laughs> See you right, downstairs. You. Have a good one. <laughs> so first, Stop holding your mouth open. I know it can be really hard. Strawberry it is. So you want strawberry? Oh, is this a special toothpaste that you can only get at the dentist? Oh, well, that's really exciting. Your teeth are gonna feel so clean. Brush your teeth with a special, special toothbrush that's for teeth tickling, and then you're gonna give, you're gonna close your mouth on the suction machine that she just put in. Okay? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Hold <laughs> your mouth open. Now you know why we fall on this. 